lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, today is a big day in the Ebling household because my daughter, Emma, got her very first job. And it didn't come easy either because she interviewed for this position as a bagger at a local grocery store back in the spring. And it was a great lesson for her, a great opportunity to learn and grow because her brother had applied uh, for this very same position a little over two years ago, and he had an, a great interview experience. He was hired on the spot, and the next thing you know, he's at orientation, and he's got this job. Well, the process didn't exactly work like that for Emma. Emma started with an interview where she was a little scared out of her mind, quite honestly, and the next thing you know, I'm shopping in this store, and I'm looking at bananas, and I turn around, and there's my little girl with big tears in her eyes because the interview was a disaster for her. She was tongue-tied. She wasn't prepared for some of the questions that she got asked. And I had prepared her for the interview as well, but I hadn't prepared her for a behavioral interview, and that was the type of interview that they were using. So we went home and we scheduled our summer knowing that she wasn't going to be working at the grocery store. And we got her into a lot of different camps doing writing and and uh, doing some plays and, and went to a folk school camp. And all the while planning to try to get her a second interview at some point at the store. Well, wouldn't you know, we find out that they have an open house, a hiring event on Saturday. So Saturday morning, we got up at 8 o'clock, we went out and grabbed a coffee together, and then I brought her over to the grocery store, and she was the very first person there for the open house hiring event, and I went off and did my shopping again, and this time, I was buying butter. I was in the dairy aisle, and I turned around, and I had a beaming 15-year-old girl, huge smile on her face, and she said, Mom, they said they're going to call me tomorrow. So that was just a very, very, very fun experience. And you know what? I am very glad it happened that way because seldom in life do we get what we want right off the bat. In so many instances, we have to try and try and keep trying because you just don't get what you want right away. And I thought it was a great lesson for Emma to learn at this point in her life, and I think it will serve her well. And I also reminded her, I said, don't forget, the reward is a job that's probably not going to be the favorite job you're ever going to have in your life, bagging groceries for customers, because customers can be difficult, bags rip, it's a lot of standing, it's a lot of bending, it's a lot of lifting. So the reward here is you know, not exactly going to be the most fun time of her life, but it's going to teach her an awful lot. And I'm so, so thankful that she's got this opportunity. Speaking of opportunities, this is something I'm really excited about. I'd like to invite you to join the Still Growing Podcast group on Facebook. So the next time you're on Facebook, all you have to do is go to the search bar and type in the words Still Growing Podcast Group and then click to join. Now, this is a brand new group, so it's just starting off, but I wanted to share it with you because I am extremely excited to have a place online where guests of my show and listeners can interact with one another. We can share stories, we can share garden tips, latest information, journal research, whatever comes our way. And it's a way to directly get information to listeners of the show. And here's another great secret. It's also where I'm going to post all of the really awesome garden giveaways from my guests and sponsors for my lucky listeners. So instead of having to go over to Twitter or reshare things on Instagram or other platforms, this will be the one place where all of that stuff is going to take place. So if you're interested in free stuff and sharing resources and interacting with guests, head on over. I'd love to interact with you there. Love to meet you. Say hi. 
uh, answer questions that you have. And if you have any ideas for the show, I'd love to hear them. So go ahead, check it out. I'd love to meet you in the group. One thing I wanted to share with you from a past guest is something that Robert Corrick had shared on his Facebook page, and his Facebook page is called The Sustainable Edible Landscapes. So uh, check that out while you're there as well, because Robert posts really great things. In fact, his most recent post is something I'll share with you. He is showing a picture of an orchard that was actually in the Sunset Magazine demonstration garden in Sonoma County. And I thought this picture and his commentary provided a great reminder to gardeners in terms of how you're planning and designing your spaces. So I'm going to walk you through this. The picture is showing an orchard that was featured in this demonstration garden. And the orchard has apricot trees and other fruit trees that are planted with what he puts in quotes is called an understory. And the understory of the tree or the area that's under the canopy of all of these fruit trees is planted with ornamental flowers flowers. And Robert acknowledges this is so beautiful. When you see the picture, if you go out to his Facebook page, you'll see it. It really is beautiful. It's very striking. But Robert's point is that this is actually making it very difficult to garden because with so many flowers beneath each tree, you have to spend so much extra time to gracefully walk among the understory to prevent crushing the plants. And Robert says that this makes pruning and harvesting so very difficult. To plant the fruit trees in a mini orchard with wood chip mulch makes much more sense to me. That's what Robert said. So put your flowers in a bed. Don't necessarily think about that understory as a place for putting a lot of plant material because you've got to work around it. Of course, fruit trees require so much pruning and attention. And then the harvest in and of itself makes that area a real workhorse area. So you want to be able to get to it. Um, And I thought that was a great point. So again, if you're looking to get some decent information about gardening, go ahead and subscribe to Robert Couric's Facebook page. It's at Sustainable Edible Landscapes. You can just like the page and then all of his information will show up in your Facebook feed. And the thing that I really appreciate about Robert is he's not a heavy poster. He's not going to be out there posting an article, you know, twice a day or something like that. He posts about once or twice a week and the content of of what he's sharing is really, really helpful and useful. So things like this about design or especially about trees. I love his information about trees and roots, so you can't go wrong there. Uh, Look him up on Facebook and uh, like his page. You won't regret it. Well, now I want to turn my attention to my guest today, Deborah Madison. I probably don't even need to tell you that she is the author of the fantastic cookbook, Vegetable Literacy, but she is. And if you haven't heard about it, you're going to want to go out and get a copy because I think it's a tremendous resource for gardeners. What Deborah has done in Vegetable Literacy is is broken down vegetables, edibles, and herbs by plant family, and then tells how to cook with them. And it's a tremendous resource for gardeners. And just understanding how different plants go together, not only in the garden, but in the kitchen. And I think that helps us become not only better gardeners, but better cooks. So the two go together. Now, just this past spring, Deborah received a huge honor from the James Beard Foundation. In fact, out of respect for her body of work, they welcomed her into the Cookbook Hall of Fame. Now, she has published 11 cookbooks, including Vegetable Literacy. I mean, she's so well known for one of her first cookbooks, which is called Vegetarian Cooking for Everyone. In fact, it's such a beloved book that oftentimes Deborah will run into folks that have had that cookbook for so many years that it's barely recognizable. The cover is off, the pages are warped and worn, and she recently had a contest on her Facebook page for who had the most worn out cookbook. Now, I do the exact opposite with mine. Mine is in a spot of honor in my office. I have one of those display stands for some special books in my bookcase. And Vegetable Literacy is one of the books that's there year-round because I love the cover too. It's glorious with these Egyptian walking onion. Oh my gosh. 
But this interview is such a pleasure, and I know you're going to enjoy it, and you'll probably learn some things about plants in the garden and how they go together. It's a real treat, so sit back and enjoy. Well, hello, Deborah. I am so excited to talk to you again. I know we talked uh, back in 2013 at Spoon River Restaurant. It was a total highlight for me. So I'm delighted to get the chance to chat with you again. Thank you. That was a fun chat. (laughs) I can't believe it's that long ago, though. I can't believe it's been that long ago. And I had never had a meal with a cookbook author before. Not only was the food fantastic, but it was fun to see, you know, waiters and and staff coming up and talking to you and and bringing us all wonderful different dishes to try. So that was quite (laughs) the experience for me. I'm sure you're so used to it that it doesn't even phase you. But to me, I thought it was... Oh, no. No, that was special. It definitely was. And I love Spoon River. So. Yeah. Oh, it was just amazing. So my daughter's actually at the Guthrie Theater that's right next door doing one of their Shakespeare camps this week. So I was dropping her off there at nine o'clock this morning. Oh, well, well, good. I hope you went by. I did. Well, anyway, we are going to spend our time today chatting about two of your cookbooks. The first is my personal favorite, Vegetable Literacy, and also a little bit about your lovely cookbook from about 10 years ago that's called Vegetable Soups. But first, let's chat about Vegetable Literacy. You know, I think the reason that this cookbook is so exciting to gardeners and cooks alike is because it draws connections between the vegetables, herbs, and edible flowers in 12 plant families, and each chapter is named for one of the dozen plant families that you focus on. So the scientific and botany side of the vegetables, I think, really helped you provide a fantastic structure and framework for your book, but it also provides clues for how to use these vegetables together in the kitchen. Yeah, that's true because families, plant families are like human families. You know, there's resemblances among members. There are also big differences, but there's similarities. And I, I think that if you know what plants are related to one another, um, which are in the plants of a particular family, you also might be aware that they share certain characteristics. For example, bitterness is a characteristic of many plants in, in the daisy family. Or the goosefoot, which is um, the quinopodia, uh, chard, spinach, beet greens, quinoa leaves, all of that. You can actually anticipate that their flavors are going to be similar. And in that case, they're very mild. And and if you understand that, then you go in the kitchen and say, oh, I want to make this the chard, but I don't have it. But I have a lot of beet greens. I think I'll use those. And you'd be quite confident, I think, to proceed like that yes. creatively. <laughs> yes. And you've said, uh, you've said before that gardening has made you a better cook. Well, it's changed my cooking, I think, because I do try to garden. And, and this summer, I really put the word try in the whole <laughs> face because it's been a very hard summer with yes. weather. But if you succeed in growing something, oh my gosh, you know, you appreciate it in a way that you don't if you just take it for granted in the supermarket. You know, you see if your plants often struggle, you may pick those leaves. They may have holes in them by, you know, made by little beetles or something. But you become so much more tolerant and forgiving. You know, you're going to eat them and you're going to appreciate them in a way that you maybe never noticed before. And for me, that's what I mean by a bitter cook. Um, you know, you you just see a lot when you have a garden. And it's not always about what we do. For example, um, I have some carrots in my garden. that We're going to talk about that later. I know those big, beautiful blossoms. They've been covered with caterpillars that are going to turn hmm. into swallowtail butterflies. And I love seeing the butterflies, so I'm sacrificing some carrot plants for them because... You know, you you begin to see those relationships up close and personal in a way that you don't if you're just going to a store. Well, I love to hear you say that. And I think it's something that happens as gardeners evolve, as we spend more time in the garden, the things that, you know, maybe used to send us, you know, screaming into the house. (laughs) Uh, Like (laughs) the the first time I was encountering a rabbit problem, I called my husband and I said, ask me what we're having for supper. And he's like, what? And I said, Hassenpfeffer, you know. (laughs) 
but you know, now this year I've I actually had a mother rabbit with babies under the deck, and you know what? They moved on. There were other places for them to be. They didn't just stay, you know, in my yard. Right, and, right. And uh, and they were adorable. So, but yeah, I hear what you're saying, and and you know, it's funny too because it re- it brings me back to when I was a little girl and I would help my grandmother in her garden. And you know, when you bring in that produce from the garden, you're thinking about it as a grower, as an owner, and cleaning those strawberries or salvaging even just little pieces of them, that's just part of what you did. But all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. when you become a consumer, when you're a shopper and you're buying those strawberries, well, they'd better be perfect. Otherwise, there's something wrong with them. So Yeah, right. And at the same time, when I watch people in grocery stores, I'm I'm always sort of appalled that they just throw things in their basket without even looking. Okay, there may be some imperfections. I'm I'm fine with imperfections, but still, when you're paying for food, you want to look, you want to give it some attention, you want to give it some care, yeah. and it just is painful to me to watch that because you would never treat anything you grew that way. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing about uh, getting disconnected from the land and di- getting disconnected from our food uh, sources, especially is you know you just don't have that appreciation. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Now, could we chat briefly about the ingredients that you regularly use in the kitchen? I noticed in the front of your um, fabulous book, Vegetable Literacy, you went ahead and listed some of the staples that you like to use. And it included this list, uh, so bear with me, butter, citrus juices, eggs, herbs, ghee, olive oil, oils in general, onion, salt, pepper, stocks, tomato, and yogurt. This was your kind of vital uh, list of things that you like to have around. (laughs) It seems so funny because we really do change. (laughs) You do? Have you changed a lot in the last three years? Are there things you don't Um, use as much? I probably would add more miso and seaweed to that list today. Yes, I do love butter. I love ghee um, I and olive oil, and I still use those, but much less. I use much less butter than I used to. I use good quality, like almond milk. I really, really love onions, of course, sea salt, you know, freshly ground pepper. But oils, I feel very strongly about. I think they need to be very well made. They tend to be expensive. I do use them. I use roasted peanut, roasted sesame oils that have a lot of flavor and quality for finishing dishes. And I don't remember if I if I spell that out so much there, but it is true that I do that. Wow. What about ghee? I mean, a lot of people have never cooked with that. I love ghee, and I didn't start using it until a woman said, hey, you have to taste my son's ghee. He makes this wonderful ghee. This company is called Ancient Organics. And I went out to Berkeley to meet with him and, and work with him a little bit. And it's so delicious. It just adds so much character to a dish. But in addition to ghee, I also use coconut oil. And I sometimes use them interchangeably, like in curries, things like that. You know, if I'm cooking for someone who doesn't want to have a dairy product, then I'll use coconut oil. And that's very good also. I find them both flavorful. They are both have a lot of personality. Um, but I think ghee is just absolutely delicious. Wow. Does it have any type of flavor at all? Oh, yeah. It definitely has flavor. You know, the solids are removed from ghee, but in the process of making them, um, they sometimes, you know, brown a little bit and caramelize. And so the ghee itself, which is like an oil, Mm -hmm. has this very rich kind of nutty, wonderful flavor. You can always detect it. And there are certain dishes in which it's quite lovely, like a red lentil soup with turmeric and so forth. You know, a little ghee turned in at the last minute. Mmm, delicious. Okay. Well, we're going to give it a try here. We're going to have... probably some blog post called the Ghee Chronicles or something. Okay. <laughs> we'll see how I it goes. Forward to that. Yeah, we'll see how it goes. I also use a lot of buttermilk. I adore buttermilk, and it's just something that's always in my refrigerator. I think it makes the most tender baked goods possible, so you can add that to the list as well. Okay, now see, that I can agree with you on. My dad's fluffy pancake recipe calls for buttermilk, so mm-hmm. we just can't make it any other way. And the kids always look in the fridge, and be, and they're saying, or do, do we have buttermilk? And they have no idea you could make pancakes without buttermilk, so this is, this is how they're being raised. <laughs> I know. I, I seem to have that idea, too. To that 
what? There's no buttermilk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, <I'm, laughs> I do love buttermilk. I'm glad that you are like us, Deborah, in that there are some times where you just don't have that ingredient and it just stops you in your tracks. That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, I loved the story that you told in the introduction of your book about your first ever trip to a nursery. It was Western oh, yeah. Hills Nursery in Sonoma County. And as you entered, you were handed glasses of champagne. And you wrote, in the same way a dog never forgets the storefront that harbors a stash of canine treats, for many years I harbored the vague expectation that I would always be handed a glass of champagne when I went into a nursery. And I I absolutely loved that. I, I could just totally see you, uh, you know, walking in and the champagne and the whole thing. It was an adorable story. And with or without uh, champagne, you are a gardener in addition to a cook. So I'm so curious what you're growing in your garden now. I am growing, I guess, actually a lot of things, even though it's been a hard summer because it's been very hot and we haven't had our rains. Um, I'm growing a couple kinds of beans. I'm growing some Romanos, some rattlesnake beans, and some salt and crescent beans, which I love. Um, I always trail them over my hoops, and they make a little shade for what's underneath, and they're very prolific. This year, I'm growing sorghum, which I've never grown before. I always grow a grain you know, of some kind. And so this year it's sorghum and two kinds of corn, a Oaxacan okay. green corn and a blue corn from hmm. Zuni Pueblo. I'm growing La Rat potatoes. Um, I always have a lot of chard, beets, and spinach. The spinach, of course, is over for right now. I grow orac, the purple and the green, and it's over too. But I just harvested my garlic. Um, I've got leeks. I have a winter squash, which this is the first time I've actually grown winter squash. It's a maroon potiron, and um, it, it's it called a chestnut squash. It's not too big, and I chose it from Seed Savers Exchange because I think it only had 85-day requirement. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I'm so used to a freeze date of October, although our summers have gotten longer, that I wanted something I knew I could manage yes. <laughs> to succeed. And I'm succeeding wildly with it. I'm amazed. Um, I have eggplants, shishito peppers, only one zucchini at a time. Uh, oh, gosh, five heirloom tomatoes, different tomatoes. And that's about it. I have some things I've just had to give up on. Um, oh, and lots and lots of herbs, but they're they're throughout the garden, both inside the wall and outside the wall. Yeah. What are, what are some that. things you no longer grow, just time, energy, Well, or like um, I had some beautiful tarbay beans um, that a friend had given me, and they weren't on drip, and the grasshoppers had been ferocious, and I just finally had to give up. I mean, I do live in the desert. We are drought. You know, it's very hot. So I, it's hard to justify using a ton of water. So I, I've realized now I just have to make some choices. Other beans are doing much better than those. So there we go. Yeah. And you're outside of Santa Fe, right? Yes, but I'm about 25 miles southeast of Santa Fe, so we're okay. even hotter. You're even hotter. Santa Fe, and it's been a really hot summer. Wow. Well, right now, as we're recording this, it's about 110 degree heat index outside. <gasps> oh my God, and that's 80% terrible. humidity in Minnesota, so it's it's pretty miserable. Oh, I'm today. so sorry. Well, we're we seem like heaven compared to you. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Because <laughs> there's no humidity no at all. Humidity. I wish there were yeah. some. Yeah. And uh, have you had any fires? Out of curiosity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's always fires. Although I, I, I tend to say, you know, we're not having so many fires now because our forests have already burned, but unfortunately they haven't all burned. And we have a lot of fires started by lightning. Um, we have uh, fires started by firecrackers, which shouldn't even be allowed here, you know, in town, in Santa Fe. Oh, I can't believe that. You know, people, uh, they like to light firecrackers. Oh, isn't this fun? And the grass catches on fire. And yeah. it, it can be lethal. Um, we're so far so good, but everything is a tinderbox. Yes, it's it is. just ready to go. Well, and you'd think with all of the information that's so available these days that some of these, uh, you know, man-made things would go away that we'd learn from it. But we just seem to can't help ourselves, I guess. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. 
Well, gardeners and chefs are on two ends of the same spectrum, which is the harvest or our food. And I always think it's fascinating because just because you're skilled at one doesn't mean you're good at the other. For instance, I have a lot of gardener friends who grow edibles just for sport. They want to see what it's like to grow a zucchini, but they have no intention of ever eating that zucchini. And then I have friends that are chefs that have no idea how to garden. So from a gardening standpoint, I love the phrase, you have to grow it to know it. And I'm wondering if the growing of certain vegetables has enhanced your skills as a cook. I'm not so sure because we're, I mean, we're a little bit limited, which is okay with me, um, in what we can grow and with our lack of soil and our, our aridity. But again, I think what I said originally um, pertains here that you become so much more tolerant and forgiving, you know, of what you do grow. You know, you're more accepting of flaws. I have discovered uh, varieties that I like a whole lot better than others. For example, the zucchini. I love the Italian Costano Romanesco, um, the rib zucchini. I just think it's beautiful to look at. It has a lot of flavor. It really Mm. holds up and so on and so forth. But, you know, (laughs) because we have a lot of squash bugs, I only grow one plant a year. Another thing it does, it makes me much more grateful to our local farmers who sell at the farmer's market for what they put up with because you learn if you go out in the heat and you try to get something to grow, what they put up with and how well they achieve it. So I'm not trying to grow everything for myself, but to try to grow some things to understand what's involved. Yes. What's involved in picking those little filet beans? It's hard work. They're yes. hard to see. You know, yeah, they cost $6 a pound, but maybe that's right. Maybe that's exactly you know? right. Yeah, you know. So, uh, yeah, it, it is informative once you start to grow your own from a number of points of view. Um, cost, labor, difficulty. Um, there's certain things I just don't like to even try, like broccoli and cauliflower, because they always get so aphid infested. So if we have a good organic farmer at the market who can do that, I am happy to pay them. Yes. Well, I was thinking that, too, when you were saying winter squash, because in my mind, I'm thinking squash bugs. I'm thinking how heavy they are, how much space it takes up. How are you finding that experience, growing winter squash this year for the first time? Oh, I'm so thrilled. I love it. (laughs) But I have had, I've figured a few things out, it seems, and with the squash, the minute it came up, I started to get squash bugs. I thought, oh, where do they come from? How do they know? You know. So I just put reme over the little plants, a big sheet of reme, and I have them in a raised bed, four plants. And I kept it there until the leaves were so big and the flowers were starting. I knew I had to take it off so that there'd be pollination. So far, knock on wood, the squash bugs haven't returned. And, and I'm getting lots and lots of squash. So we'll see. I mean... Summer's not over yet. That's right. <laughs> but so far, it's worked, you know. Um, and zucchini, you know, I I had to go to California for a photo shoot, and I had some started, and they were outdoors, and a hailstorm got them and um, kind of punctured the main stem. So I only have one zucchini plant going right now, and I'm I'm watching it, and it's struggling because it didn't like having its stem pierced with mm. ice. <laughs> yeah. Well, in your chapter about the carrot family, I love the story that you share about the inspiration you drew from a second-year carrot that went to seed, because it helped you see the connections with other things that were in that family, like dill and carrots and Queen Anne's lace, that were maybe some maybe less obvious before they bolted. And I'm wondering what some of your favorite recipes are that incorporate umbles like carrots and parsnips and celery. Ah, okay. Well, I, I mean, carrots, I, I do, I love, I've always found them so easy to grow and they're so prolific and so on and so forth. So, um, I love them in soups and I have a number of soups in vegetable literacy. Um, I, I use them in a chilled carrot soup because often it's hot long before we're going to have tomatoes. <laughs> you know, yes. tomatoes aren't the only soup that can be chilled. So, but carrots are very, very good, especially if you add a kind of lively yogurt sauce as a garnish. I love them in a hot soup with a tangle of collard greens and a little coconut butter and a, and a mix of dukkha, which are those spicy seeds that go on top. I use the white carrots to make an ivory-colored carrot soup. And it's very odd because when people eat it, 
they recognize carrot, but they're they're confused by the color because it's not orange. Oh, that's so, awesome. So to clear to clue them in, I put a little dice of orange carrots on top. But I mean, carrots come in many colors, and orange is one of the later colors that was developed. It, it, it does make sense, but it's not something we're familiar with. I love to make a carrot cake, but I make one with um, almonds. It's Italian, and it's very light. It's not like our usual dark carrot cake that's saturated with pineapple and raisins and all that. This is a more like a sponge cake, and I use the pale yellow carrots for that. Yeah, it looks very buttery because of the color, but it's not. Parsnips, you know, I'm not actually a really crazy about parsnips, but I have used them, and I do have a few recipes for them in the book, uh, in a custard, in a sweet custard, because, you know, all these umbilifer vegetables have a lot of sugars in them, and when you cook the parsnips and puree them, suddenly they, they're changed. I mean, you, you taste it and you taste their sweetness and you add cardamom, you know, some honey, milk, and they make a really lovely dessert. But then I like to go in the other direction with parsnips too, which is to serve them with something that's really more abrasive, like a horseradish cream. And I think that works out pretty well too. Mm. Now, do you say, um, is it lovage or lovage? How do you say that? Oh, I always say lovage, but a lot of people say lovage. <laughs> yes, yes. I've heard it a couple of different ways. Well, I happened to get a uh, specimen of that from a Ramsey County plant sale, which is the oldest garden club in the state of Minnesota. And I bought it not knowing anything about it. And here in my garden, it grows to about seven feet tall. It's wow, very tall. And I kind of like you with the white carrot soup. I love to take people on a tour through my garden. They say these huge stalks. They have no idea what it is. And then I'll hand them a leaf and say, what do you think this is? And they recognize that smell because, of course, it's in the salary kind of family. But I had never seen in a cookbook anyone mention lovage until I saw it in vegetable literacy. Do you regularly incorporate that? Oh, I love lovage. I've used it for the last 30 years. Yeah, I do. I especially like it in the spring when the leaves are still soft and, you know, and shiny and they have more flavor then. Okay. Um, I love to just tear the leaves and put them in a salad or in a cucumber sandwich. Um, gosh, I think I wrote about that in Savory Way and that was a long time ago. Wow. Uh, yeah, I like lovage a lot. People often look at the plant and they say, oh, is it parsley? Is it celery? And oddly enough, I mean, it's in the same family with the carrots and all of that. It's a, it makes it humble for a flower. Um, but it's more pungent, and I think it's very good for waking up foods that might be a little bit stodgy, like potatoes or sometimes eggs or mm. or whatever. But I, I think it's an incredibly dynamic herb. We have we have two lovage plants in the Master Gardener's Herb Garden, and I was so shocked to see them because they're really robust. They're really doing well. And nobody in the garden I was working with knew what they were. Yeah. Or had even, you know, tried tasting it. Oh, taste it. It would take stock home. By the way, the stocks are hollow, and you can use them as straws, like in a Bloody Mary. Oh, my gosh. I didn't think about that. Just yeah. like with celery. That's fantastic. Yeah. I love Give it that. a try. <laughs> well, you know, I noticed the stalks because I had to cut mine down when I was redoing this one bed. And this was an, a, a very established plant, like a 10-year-old plant. And, I mean, it reminded me of bamboo. This stuff gets very, very tough the older it gets. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Of course, the bamboo is a totally different family member. Yes, it is. <laughs> Touche. Yeah, yes, it um, is. You know, the ca- interesting thing about the carrot family, as you're calling it, is it has so many herbs in it. And lovage, of course, is one. But there's also parsley and cumin and coriander, caraway, chervil, angelica, you know, fennel, dill, um, the list is, is surprisingly long. It's like the mint family. Um, there are a lot of herbs in this um, family. And once I did become aware of those beautiful humble flowers, then I started looking, oh, look at the cilantro. It makes one, too. Yes. <laughs> Slightly different. Look at chervil. Tiny, 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 but it makes one. Our angelica is huge, you know. 
Um, but you do start to recognize the form. And those herbs are so important because they can take any vegetable in any number of directions. You pair corn with parsley, cumin, or coriander, or caraway, or <laughs> whatever, or dill. You know, you have you have a different you have a different animal each time. Yes. Well, and how fun would that be to do a little taste test, line it all up, and and have folks come through and and try it for themselves? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. You know, one of the other things I love about you, Deborah, is that you use all the parts of a plant. I mean, you're not afraid to experiment in that way. And, you know, people say often that there are more nutrients in the leaves than there are in the actual, you know, piece of the plant that we traditionally eat. Uh, You love to cook with leaves, right? I do. And, and actually, that's true of, of um, two plants in particular, the radish and turnip. You know, that the nutrition really is in the leaves, not so much in the roots. Um, so I, I, you know, I always want to get radishes with lots of fresh greens on them. They make a lovely soup. Um, you can add them to any soup. If they're really tender, you can add them to a salad or you can, sl- you know, slice them thinly and mix them with julienne radishes and maybe a little butter to make a radish butter. And and the turnips, you know, the greens are pungent. The roots are sweet. And you actually want those two flavors together to kind of balance out the extremes and um, and you get the nutrition from them. You know, it just makes sense. Uh, And there are other things, too. I mean, beet leaves. I love beet leaves, for sure. When your collards go to flower, they send up a shoot with yellow flowers. Delicious. Tender. Really, really nice. I am actually not all that courageous because every time I pull up a very old charred plant and I look at that root, I think, I should try to eat this. (laughs) And I don't. I put it in the compost. But I always think, well, I probably could eat it if I had to because, again, it's related to beets, to spinach, and so forth. It's gnarly looking, but it's big and solid, and I'm I'm quite sure it's edible. (laughs) But but, um, I'm waiting for another day to try that. Well, and maybe if you treat it like, you know, with kale where you slice it very thinly, you know, you could work with it a little bit more. Yeah, maybe so. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Well, I'll let you know. So I'm curious. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I'm curious when you were adding adding uh, radish leaves to soups, do you how do you add them? Do you do you chop them up or what are you doing to Well radish it depends. I, I do make them. a potato soup that has a lot of radish leaves in it and I just chop them roughly, you know, and wilt them with the onions or leeks or whatever, add the potatoes and you know, I would just treat them like I would chard or, or any other green. They're actually quite mild. Um, you might think because radish roots are hot that the leaves would be, but they're not. They're good. They're mild. Hmm. They're wonderful. Well, in the mint family, I always have student gardeners that are working for me. And the first thing I teach them is that, you know, mint has the square stem. So feel that stem. And and you can detect that mint in so many of our other herbs, like basil, especially if it's really, you know, young, if it's a young plant. I always feel like you can pick up that scent of mint a little bit more. Do you grow a lot of things in the mint family in your garden? Apparently, I do. Um, I, I actually made a list the other day for a radio show I was on, and, and it, it went on quite a, quite long. But, <laughs> of course, sage and rosemary. I mean, rosemary, we have a hard time getting it through the winter, but so far, so good. Different kinds of thymes, oregano, marjoram, and hyssop, um, basils. Uh, now, lemon verbena is not in the mint family I don't think I just made a list of herbs that I'm growing, and that's one. But yeah, I do. I I I love those herbs. I think they're really interesting. And what you said about detecting mint in the flavor of, say, basil, you can. And early in the spring, and this was even more true when I lived on the California coast that was foggy, uh, when sage blooms early in the spring with its little purple blossoms, you can detect the mint quality in that. As the summer goes on, its flavor changes, of course, you know, and it be, and it's really not so much a summer herb as it is a really early spring or a fall and winter herb. 
But yeah, I agree with you. You can detect it, particularly in the basils and the sage blossoms. Well, and I think it's one of the fascinating things about working with young people because before they have prescribed these labels to plants, oh, this is basil, this is, you know, rosemary or whatnot, when they're uh, first trying to detect what they're smelling, it's so fascinating to listen to what they think it is, you know, before they've, you know, gotten older and, and they know basil is basil and they just assume, you know, that it's going to smell Mm -hmm. a certain way. So I like listening to that, what they think it is. And oftentimes they're going back to these, you know, family origins. They're picking up on those little nuances that I think a lot of times, you know, gardeners don't because we we know what it is and that's what it is. And Uh, so are are you suggesting then that someone who doesn't really know the name might smell basil and say, oh, is this a mint? Yes. And the kid, Uh my garden, yes, my student gardener do that all the time. And then I kind of, yep. And I kind of chuckle and I'm like, well, it's in the mint family. And, and so that's, I think the best part about working with kids. I don't know what it is. I mean, all through our lives, right. It's, you know, things have labels and labels and preferences kind of, you know, tend to be a sources of division. But when you don't even know that there's a label, I think sometimes you're more open to really fully mm-hmm. appreciating, you know, what's before you. So it's interesting to, you know, to listen to new people in the garden that have nothing, no prescribed notions about at all yeah. what they're seeing or smelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one thing I was very curious about, you know, the next family that you talk about is the sunflower family, and it Mm -hmm. includes daisies, asters, uh, dandelions, all that good stuff. And you call it uh, the group of ruffians because of their challenging nature. They have long roots, tough exteriors, like the beautiful artichoke. But I was really shocked that it included lettuce. I didn't didn't even know that. Oh, yeah, lettuce is in there, too. If you let your lettuce go to seed, you'll see it makes a little daisy flower. That's how you can tell. But, you know, lettuce can easily be bitter. Yes, Um, that's right. And especially with heat. And I remember once we had a priest bless our our farmer's market, and one of the things he said, and may your lettuce never be bitter. (laughs) Ah. And he, it does get bitter as it gets older and as it matures. But actually, it's my, my father... He referred to this um, whole family as looks like some rough stuff from the outer doors, and I always loved that he said that, and it's so true. I mean, I grew cardoons for this to try it out. Cardoons, wonderful plant, but you go to pick them, oh my gosh, they have spines on their stems that nab you every time if you don't cut them off. There's thorns on artichokes. Um, lettuce can be bitter, radicchio, dandelion, all those things can be bitter. Um, it, there's a combination in this family that I love of innocence and kind of meanness. Yes. You know, like some of the flowers, like daisies, asters, it is after ACA, means little stars, um, sunflower and so forth. They're so innocent. They're so sweet, you know, (laughs) and the vegetables are so rough. (laughs) They're so rough. Wow. Now, I'm curious, have you ever made the mistake of growing Jerusalem artichoke? Oh, yes, I have. And (laughs) and I I think this is the summer you're going to get rid of them because they're not liking this lack of rain. But yeah, Jerusalem artichokes, that's... (laughs) That's that's the, one of the plants that gardeners say, whatever you do, don't grow those because you'll never get rid of them. As a young gardener, I thought, oh, that's the kind of plant I want. I want something that you're not going to get rid of <laughs> because I'll have a chance of success. So I took some and I planted a four-by-four-foot bed. They're still coming up, even though I have dug them and dug them and dug them out year after year. They just don't go away. On the other hand, I don't want them to all go away because... I think they're kind of a good vegetable. You know, I'm not going to pay $6 a pound at Whole Foods for Jerusalem artichokes. My gosh, they're a weed. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you know, but it is true. I mean, once you have them, they're they're very tenacious, and they stay around for a long time. But they are, you know, a sunflower, and they make a beautiful little star-like sunflower that's sometimes 8, 10, 12 feet above the ground, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is, is it seems like every family has at least an herb in it, and tarragon is the herb in Asteraceae. Yes. And it's it's a really, I think it's a very interesting herb. And unlike some of the plants we mentioned, it's a good plant. It's, it's not going to turn around and bite you or sting you or <laughs> anything yes. like that. 
Yeah. I had a friend just bring me tarragon. She comes into my garden and she's a fantastic cook and she has liberty to harvest whatever she wants, whenever she wants. And she called me on the phone the other day and she's like, you don't have tarragon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like, no, I didn't grow it this year. I'm so sorry. So I was just in a garden tour this weekend. And of course, she brought me a little tarragon plant. So that's going to find its way back to the kitchen garden here this weekend. But yeah, so uh, it's a good it's a good thing to have in the garden. It is. And I think tarragon used to be much more popular. I think when we discovered basil, a lot of herbs that used to be used a lot kind of went away, and I think tarragon might be one of them, but I think it's a fabulous herb, but you have to like that licorice flavor, which it does have. I think it's very good. I love it as a seen herb in the spring when the chervil and the chives and the new parsley, everything is little and tender and fresh, and you chop them all together and, you know, use them in a dish as a seasoning. I I think I love tarragon. I think it's great. Hmm. It is interesting. And you want to plant the French one, though, of course, not the Russian one, which okay. it just rambles around like a big old weed. Is the flavor you different? Know. Well, the Russian one doesn't seem to have much flavor. The French one really does have a lot of flavor. And it's a very strong plant, at least for here. I mean, when I started this garden, I planted it in a lot of different places just because I wasn't sure what it was going to like. Because our sun is really strong. And um, it's done well every place. Hmm. It doesn't matter. But grasshoppers like it. Yes. Uh, Well, don't they just like about everything? Yeah, they've demolished it at one plant. Yeah. Well, the knotweed family is the next one, and that includes rhubarb and sorrel, but it it refers to the joints or the stems in the flowers, like in buckwheat. This has to be a very tough group to combine together when you're cooking, isn't it? Yeah, it, it was. It, it was. It is. I mean, I looked at it because most plants, families, you see a relationship, you know, with flavors. And I thought, hmm, this is breaking all the rules because yes. you have rhubarb and sorrel, which are incredibly tart, and then you have buckwheat, which is treated as if it's a grain. And yes. it's a little bit. I love buckwheat, but it can be a little on the stodgy side compared to sorrel and rhubarb. So I thought, how on earth can you bring these together? And I thought, well, you could have a buckwheat crepe with a sorrel sauce. Very good combination. Maybe stuff some mushrooms in it. You know, that would certainly be one way. Or you could use buckwheat flour to make a galette dough, and you could fill it with rhubarb in it. It seemed like there were a number of ways in which you could put them together in which they would actually flatter each other. Yes. Well, the cra- cabbage family, the cruciferous uh, family, uh, you identify or helped identify it through the cross-shaped flowers. That, yeah, uh, cruciferous. That is yes. Cr- yeah. Yes. And these are so many of the vegetables that we are told we need to eat. Things like cabbage and kale and arugula. It's a very, very big family. And people seem to have very strong feelings about it because they either really like it or they really don't. Well, my feeling is they think they really like it (laughs) or they really don't because I think few people really have a lot of experience with these foods in their season. You know, um, I mean, if you have broccoli that's fresh in the garden, my gosh, it's, it's just lovely and delicate and sweet. It's delicious. And, um, you know, this is true with so many plants. Uh, people think collards are going to be bitter. I hear that over and over again. I said, well, cook some collard greens and taste them. They're not bitter. (laughs) Um, They're very, very mild. So I I actually think that people in some ways have opinions that aren't necessarily based on experience. Mm -hmm. You know, kale. Kale is like, to me, it's like boring. It's so mild. You have to really introduce something interesting like garlic or anchovies or whatever, to make it come alive. Um, I like kale, but I don't find it a really dynamic, strong-tasting kind of thing. Cauliflower, too, is is pretty bland. But that's okay, because you can bring it places. You can bring it into a curry, which is lovely, or... You know, you could serve it with a little mesco sauce, and it would be lovely. There's so many ways you can look at um, members of this family and things you can do with them. Like broccoli, which people seem to have a difficulty with. Um, I, I think it's one of those plants that you really want to pump up with 
tomatoes, with chili, with feta cheese, with herbs, with things that are kind of strong tasting. Then, then people seem to like it better, mm. you know, the strong and lively kind of tasting. But turnips, oh my gosh, you know, turnips, now everyone's growing the Hakurai Japanese salad turnips. They're so sweet and mild and you can eat them raw. I kind of miss the old-fashioned purple top strong tasting turnips. Really? Okay. So, I don't know. I think this is a family that there is a kind of resistance to, but again, I don't think it's really based in knowledge. I know if you do try to grow these, they're hard to grow. Aphids are very attractive to all the members of this family. Do you find that to be so? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and they're gross, you know, and if there's really a big infestation or if you grow something and it dies, you know, your broccoli plant is finished, you know, it does stink when yes. <laughs> you know, when it's, and it's not a nice smell. So if that's all you know, well, you're maybe not going to be that attracted to the plant. But of course, if you do know that, it means you're a gardener. So you are attracted. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, so, but I do, I do think that, that we don't always have the best, We don't always have real knowledge of these plants. So, um, you know, to know them is to love them. That's right. Well, and speaking of resistance, that leads us to the nightshade family, which is, yeah, uh, yeah, which is this whole family of what I consider to be black sheep, because of course, when they were first introduced, you know, people were so resistant to them because of, uh, you know, the poisonous uh, aspect. And then um, also the the fact that they can uh, stimulate joint pain. Um, But yet at the same time, where would we be without love apples, tomatoes, uh, potatoes? Yeah, eggplant. Plant and so forth. Yes. You know, I I w- read when I was researching this book that eggplants were originally used as ornamentals when they came from India to to England, and because the, the fruits were so bitter, and of course people mm. didn't know what to do with them, sure. but they planted them as ornamentals, and they're beautiful, beautiful plants. So yes. I thought that's really interesting. But I will say one thing about the nightshade family: it makes for great stories. I mean, there are so many stories about you know, what diseases these are going to cause, um, why people resisted the potato here and there, because it's not mentioned in the Bible, because a dog wouldn't eat it, because yes. of this and that, and, and all the, you know, machinations that were used to get people to grow and eat potatoes. And, and now, you know, I mean, you're right, where would we be without them? A lot of us wouldn't be at all. That's exactly. So, yeah, some kids who eat pretty much French fries, potatoes, all that kind of stuff. Can you imagine tater tots? What would they do? Yeah, yeah, and tomatoes, of course, we love. But there was a time when um, I think I read, put this in the book when a, a doctor in America had to stand up and eat a tomato in front of people to prove that he wouldn't fall over dead. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was kind of a belief that tomatoes cause stomach cancer, and, and yeah, it's just crazy, you know. But, I mean, they, they, all these numbers are challenging for people, and, and people still say, well, I'm not eating eggplant because of my arthritis. Yes. I hear that. It, it's not that uncommon. Absolutely. But I, I love eggplant, especially as a cook who concentrates on vegetables. It's one of the few vegetables that's just not sweet. You know, a lot of vegetables do have a lot of sugars in them. Eggplant doesn't, and um, you can do so much with it. But again, the difference between an eggplant from the garden that you pick and you bring in the house and you slice and you cook, and one from the store that's been in cold storage for who knows how long. I mean, I never salt the eggplant I grow. There's no reason to. They're mild. They're delicious. Yeah. One of my blogging friends, uh, Julie Thompson Adolph, just posted, uh, she harvested her first uh, eggplant yesterday, and it was a white, I think the brand was uh, Japanese uh, white egg eggplant. It was gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely gorgeous. So. Uh, Goosefoots, that's spinach, charred beets. Uh, you once told me about the time you had a farmer that showed you, you, you made him oh, show yeah. you. I was in Ohio and, and, and walking with a, with a friend by a farm and there were all these geese and we ran into the farmer. I said, could you just pick up a goose and show me the foot? You know, and, and it, once I saw the foot, I recognized it as the shape, you know, of the leaves of the members of this family. Not exact, of course, yes. you know, because things change over time. But 
I thought, well, it's a Greek name, Kinopod, you know, Kinopod, Goosefoot or Kinopodiaceae. And so how did they know? I mean, did someone else pick up a goose or did they see the tracks in the, in the dirt and, <laughs> and call them that? Or did geese like to eat them? I don't know how the name got started, but for me, it was helpful because, you know, it's such an intriguing name. And then suddenly you look and say, ah! There it is, you know. Yes, this one's longer, that one's wider than the goose I saw, but they're different kinds of geese, just like there's different kinds of plants. So, yes, it was helpful. Yes. Well, that it made complete sense to me once you shared that story, and I've never forgotten it, so I love that you shared that again. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And then, well, plants lead you to all kinds of experiences and questions, that's for sure. Well, yes, that's absolutely right. But once you understand the, the genesis of some of those names, it really does help you become a better gardener in terms of being able to identify these different plant families. So that's fantastic. And, and not just the gardener, but I mean, just walking around, you know. I mean, I look at curly dock that grows in a certain place in our village, and I know it's related to sorrel and buckwheat, and I look at the leaf, and I look at those things, and I taste it, and you say, oh, yeah, that's it, you know, what family that one belongs to, and so forth. So I think it's, it's, it makes the world come into focus as yes. well as your garden. Yep, that's absolutely right. Now, the former lily family is, you've combined the alliums and the asparagus, and there is a fantastic photo of you that I've seen on your website where you are holding the most ginormous allium, and it's a photo by Christopher Hersheimer, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And I had to ask, is that from your garden, this huge allium? No, I wish it were. It was from the Seed Savers Exchange Garden, and Christopher and I were there making some photographs for the book and um, it was lying on the ground and I, I bent down and it, and it just came up in my hand, this huge thing. And it was just so fabulous looking. I, I love alliums, all of them, every single one of them. But I did say it's the former Lily family because it used to all be the same. And now with a DNA means of discerning family characteristics, a lot of the former alliums have been split up. And asparagus used to be there, lilies used to be there, onions, chives, all of those used to be linked together. And I wanted to keep them together because I love that onions, which are such an everyday kind of, oh, you chop an onion, start a soup, whatever, food is in the same family with asparagus, which is this, like, most ethereal, you know, queen of spring. And I thought, yeah, I like that. I like that, too. I'm kind of sorry that they're not still together, but anyway, I took that liberty. Well, and the Egyptian onions are what's on the cover of your book, which I I suppose that's why I love the cover of your book so much, because I have them all over my garden, and, and they truly are so fantastic. When you look at them, the architecture, and they're curling all over, and they're falling into paths, I think they are just absolutely tremendous. Yeah, I love them. And when I saw that image um, on the designer's computer, I said, that's the cover. That's the cover of the book. And, and once it went up on you know, Amazon and various websites, people would write and say, what did they say? <laughs> <laughs> like they were spelling something. And I said, oh, no, wow. they, they don't really say anything. Um, but I love Egyptian onions. I just think they're, they're, they make me laugh. They're so funny, you know, but they have a very good mechanism for spreading. You know, they make these little top setting bulbs and, and then they get heavy and they fall over and the bulbs fall off and that's how they they march through your garden and they do they make their way wherever they want to go so you gotta be a little careful with that yeah you do although where i am i'm thrilled (laughs) he wants to grow especially this summer (laughs) oh yeah this has been brutal for you i bet yeah it's been really hard the cucurbit family Mm mm-hmm they are my favorite yes you call them my favorite yeah you call them the sensual family members yeah, I just love the way, you know, they curve and they vine and and the fruits are so succulent and they're they're just absolutely a beautiful family. And I think if if I were a farmer, that's what I would want to grow are cucurbits, especially winter squash. Because there's so many great varieties of winter squash that we just don't know about. And I so admire the farmers who care 
because they're heavy. <laughs> yes. They have to be picked up and they have to be lugged to market and then they probably have to be lugged home again. That takes real dedication yeah. to go through all of that. But I've certainly encountered some fabulous uh, winter squash, which people just won't, they won't try them because the butternut is pretty standard, it's pretty good, and it's very good squash, but there's even more better ones out there like Marina di Chiogia, which is all warty and blue. It doesn't have a smooth skin. You know, you have to like really slam into it with a big knife. But once you get that squash open, the flesh is so delicious. It's so good. And that's what's used to make the so-called pumpkin ravioli in Italy. It's oh. from northern Italy. Huh. And um, it has big, big flavor. And violina du Vigosa, which is a kind of butternut, but it's a larger one, and it's sh- it comes in in the center and out at the ends. And uh, It's a beautiful squash, handsome, so delicious. Oh, my gosh. It makes me sad that the butternut is a good squash because <laughs> it, it eclipses everything else. Yeah. Well, I think your description of these others will make listeners want to give them a try. I know myself, I'll be looking for them. So Yeah, and whenever I see them at the farmer's market, if someone has taken the effort to grow a good Hubbard or, you know, anything besides what I can get at the store, I'm happy to buy them. And I love to look at them. In fact, I have to make myself use them because they're so gorgeous. You know, and I just line them up and admire them. And then I think one day, you know, I really ought to eat it Mm -hmm. (laughs) while there's still some nice, moist flesh inside. Well, they are beautiful. Well, I want to, in the interest of time, I want to touch briefly on the grass family and then the legumes. And in the grass family, you mentioned that um, our grains are really in the grass family. And I think a lot of people wouldn't consider grains as part of the grass family. Well, they don't know, um, but yes, they are. I mean, when something is a pseudo-grain, it's in another family, like buckwheat or quinoa. But um, the grasses are what produce the grains that we eat, like millet, rice, wheat, sorghum, you know, farro, einkorn, um, barley, all of those things. It also includes the grass that grows in our yards, you know, and front and back. It includes bamboo, which is an amazing an amazing plant, um, and lots of other things. But it's a very, very important family. And, um, you know, that's grass. Legumes. Here's something I'd love for you to comment on uh, because it's in your cookbook, and my husband loves peas, and it was your pea recipe with baked ricotta and breadcrumbs. Oh, I love that recipe. Yes. Could you virtually make that with us really quick? Yeah, sure. Um, you're going to bake ricotta, which is the easiest thing in the world. You just put it in a flat dish and okay. drizzle some olive oil on top. It goes into a moderate oven until it starts to pull away from the sides of the dish and brown a little bit on top. Um, I think I put some breadcrumbs on that, too, for texture. And then the peas, just going to cook them very, very briefly in a little butter, a few tablespoons of water, you know, and then you just spoon them on top. Now, I did them with sage in the book, thinking of them as the spring. We were talking about that kind of minty quality that sage has yes. instead of just using mint, which is kind of obvious. But we actually have peas all summer long here because they come from much, much higher altitude than I am at 7,000 feet. So I would change it, change my herbs through the summer. I wouldn't use sage now. I might use basil. I might use mint and so forth. But yeah, that's it. It's a very simple recipe. Very, very simple and yet very delicious sounding. And a little unusual. And a little unusual. That's exactly right. Well, Phil is going to like that I have discovered that with you because uh, he is such a pea lover that he'll eat any recipe that has peas in it. It always. Oh, Kathy, you're lucky. My husband's the opposite. (laughs) (laughs) Patrick's not a big fan of peas. Peas or beans or any of those things. He's really, (laughs) are we going to have those? (laughs) And yet this was part of God's plan, right? Bringing the two of you together. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, last but not least, let's chat quickly about soups. And soups are uh, so popular now. I was reading that if a restaurant is serving soup, they can drive traffic, more traffic into the restaurant, I think, an increase of over 50%. And gardeners are always asking me uh, about summer soups. It's like we go through the, the summertime and there's just not a lot of 
uh, soup making going on, and yet people want to make soups with their garden harvest. So, could you, yeah, they do. Yeah, could you talk us through making a simple vegetable stock? Well, you know, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time in the sp- summer, especially with a stock. But what I do is I make what I call a quick stock, and if I'm making a vegetable soup, which of course I am often. Um, I use the parts of the vegetable that aren't going into the soup to make a stock. For example, celery root, you know, has this really tough, ugly-looking skin full of flavor. You wash it. You cut it off the celery root. So I might be making a stock while I'm prepping everything else. So I always add an onion, maybe a sprig of thyme or two, a bay leaf. Um, you know, just really basic kinds of ingredients, plus whatever else is going into that soup. If the potato skins are a product of, of the soup preparation, I'll put those in the stock. Um, celery ends, uh, you know, things like that. Now, this does not make a resoundingly huge broth type of thing. I think it's really hard to do that with vegetables, but it does underscore the flavors of the soup, and that's what I want to do. And how about this white miso soup that you feature in that vegetable soup book that you have? Oh, yeah. I I love a white miso soup. I do make a dashi for a stock, um, and I use kombu, and I use um, the dried bonito fish uh, flakes, which if you're vegetarian, you can leave those out. The dashi is just, uh, and use just the kelp, which is a really good food to eat. White miso is the sweetest, most delicate of the misos. Once you have your water or your dashi, you put that uh, a slurry of the miso with that you've made with water into the soup, add tofu. In this case, I use the purple wakame, which is another kind of seaweed, a little ginger. And um, you don't want to boil miso or you destroy its good life-giving qualities, but you heat the soup up. And when the tofu rises to the surface, it's hot enough. I actually think, although I didn't write it with this in mind, it could be a good summer soup because I don't think it needs to really be served hot. Oh, there you go. You know, I think it could be kind of tepid and it would be nice. In fact, I think I'm going to try that tonight. Well, there you go. I like that idea. I, I, and thinking about that uh, is such a great reminder for people as well that it doesn't have to be the two extremes, chilled or hot. It can be kind of a lukewarm soup. Yeah, it, it can be. It's, it's, I don't think it's a popular temperature or a well-known no. temperature yet in this country, but I think sometimes tepid is good. And it's interesting. I mean, summer, we think of winter as the time for soup. You know, but but really, they can be in the summer. Any vegetable can become a soup. The one that I read that I thought was perfect for this time of year is your pepper and tomato soup. Yeah, and well, I, I see this as kind of a late summer or fall soup when the tomatoes are in and the peppers um, may be earlier where you are than where I am. But I love this soup, and I, I it doesn't say it in the title, but it is seasoned with saffron and basil, and it has a little noodle nest of uh, very thin noodles that are just bound with a little egg and then fried lightly. And um, that gives it some substance. So I think that this is a fall soup or late summer when you might want to make it a main dish and have the substance of the noodles. Or or you could just have some fideos in there, some rice to give it a little oomph. But I like this especially with yellow peppers because they're some of the latest ones that come on. Oh, that's a great idea and very pretty. Yeah. Let's uh let's get your input very quickly on gazpacho and then we'll close the show. I Sure. I, um this white gazpacho I I made because I had it in Spain. I loved it. My husband hates the standard gazpacho with raw cucumbers and onions which he can't eat. This is based on on pureed almonds, garlic and melon. And it's and olive oil. And I think it's just sort of ethereal and wonderful. And and it is a chilled soup. It's refreshing. And it's rich, too. So you don't need a lot of it, just a, a little bit. You know, you could serve it in shooters before dinner, almost. Well, Deborah, I want to thank you for being on the show. It's been delightful to chat with you again. To get your walk through of vegetable literacy and also some tips on summertime soups, was, which was just tremendous. And uh, before we go, I want to congratulate you on your James Beard Award that you won for one of your earlier works. It wasn't vegetable literacy. 
Oh, I know. It was vegetarian. Well, it, it was actually a Cookbook Hall of Fame award, and I'm not sure if it was for a particular book or not, but they kept talking about vegetarian cooking for everyone, which is now in a new version that's more up to date, and I'd be happy to give a copy away. Oh, that would be fantastic. We'll put in the show notes how you can win a copy of Deborah's book. And if people are interested, they can get to you either through your website or email you directly. You hear from people all the time who have questions or just want to give you feedback on your all of your wonderful content. Well, thank you. Yes. And my website, by the way, is just DebraMadison.com. Awesome. And you have a couple of Facebook accounts as well. So if people want to check up on you on social media or see things that you're posting, they can do that as well. And again, I just want to thank you for being with me today, Deborah. It was absolutely delightful. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And I hope to see your garden one day. Oh, wouldn't that be tremendous? Hey, if you get to Minnesota, let me know. I'd be happy to give you a tour. Okay. You're on. All right. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Well, that's it for our show today. I want to thank Deborah Madison for being my guest. Wasn't that just lovely? And just a reminder that I'll have all the generous information that Deborah shared on the show today under the Still Growing podcast page on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A dot com. And if you really like the show, I'd like to invite you to join the Still Growing podcast group on Facebook. Just go to Facebook and in the search bar type Still Growing growing podcast group. It's a great place to ask questions, share your own garden stories, interact with some of the great guests featured on Still Growing, and also connect with other listeners of the show. And here's the secret. It's also where I'll post all of the really awesome garden giveaways for my guests and sponsors for my lucky listeners, just like the cookbook that Deborah Madison is giving away today. So please go ahead and check it out. I'd love to meet you on the Still Growing podcast group on Facebook. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.